that's fine. Yeah, so uh, it's, I'm presenting the work today that we've done at the University of Sheffield. We are still doing actually uh, together with Siemens Digital Industries. And it's aimed at trying to develop perhaps the simplest or the, the oldest maybe approach to uh, surface velocimetry, which is surface Doppler velocimetry, which Mark has mentioned already, mainly with regard to, uh, to radar, but as we'll see, it's not really the, the only option. And what we are trying to develop, we call it space-time surface Doppler velocimetry, and we'll see uh, perhaps why uh, in this presentation. So if my slides move, yeah, okay. So when we talk about uh, Doppler, the, the main principle is quite straightforward. So we have some sensor which is emitting a signal which reflects on the water surface. We record the reflection at the same location. And from the frequency shift, then we estimate the speed of that surface. There are lots of sensors in the market already, uh, which differ by the kind of uh, signal that they use. So we work with the sound, with ultrasound. There are some laser-based sensors. Uh, perhaps the most common, the ones that you, you may be more familiar with are uh, based on radar. It really makes no big difference. So the, the principle is the same, the kind of scales typically are the same and the, the challenges as well are the same. Perhaps laser is the only one that uh, is, stands apart a little bit, but radar and ultrasound are very similar. Uh, so um, what these methods have in common is that they rely upon the uh, deformation of the water surface and the presence and the movement of these surface uh, deformations. So we know we've spent um, quite a lot of time at Sheffield investigating this kind of phenomena, try to uh, describe the surface deformations in rivers. And typically we uh, identify two big families of surface deformations. The first group are everything which is created locally by turbulence. We call them turbulent boils, scars, vortices. They can have different shapes, but they have in common that they usually uh, represent something which is happening directly beneath them in terms of turbulence. And then we have gravity waves, which are basically like ocean waves. So they can be generated by wind but also by the bed roughness. So think about standing waves and then shallow flows. Uh, and what we found is that uh, they can also be generated by turbulence. And sometimes they almost don't look like gravity waves. So they're, they're not always very simple to identify. So the easiest, the, the best, in my opinion, approach to identify all these patterns is what is called the frequency wave number spectrum. So hopefully everybody knows what the frequency uh, indicates. So it's a number of fluctuations per second of a given signal. Uh, the wave number is basically the same, but in space. So it indicates how many wavelengths per unit length, so per meter or more commonly per two pi meter. And these two frequencies, so the spatial and temporal frequency are related by the speed. So the speed of a wave is the ratio between two pi f frequency and the wave number. So like if we take a Fourier transform of a signal in time, we have a frequency spectrum. If we take a Fourier transform in space and in time, then we have a frequency wave number spectrum, which indicates how the energy of the waves it is distributed at different spatial and temporal frequencies. So we typically see something like this. We have a wave number axis on the, on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. So everything that has a constant ratio, so everything along a straight line here, has a constant speed. So everything along this dashed green line moves at the same speed of the flow. So we call it a turbulent boil. Everything above it is faster, it has a higher frequency and higher speed. So these are gravity waves that are propagating downstream and everything below is uh, slower. So these are gravity waves that are trying to move upstream. So why I'm showing this is basically because uh, these kind of plots give us a lot of information about what's happening in the flow, uh, but also uh, they bear a direct relation with the Doppler spectra. So in the simplest case, if the surface deformations are very small, then we can represent a Doppler spectrum by this uh, equation. So we have the frequency spectrum of our reflected signal at the frequency of the original signal plus some delta function, some, some frequency shift which is the convolution of two functions. Uh, this zeta in red 
is the frequency wave number spectrum. So it's the same figure that I showed earlier. So it's functional frequency and wave number and indicates the amplitude of all the waves on the water surface. And then this is, so the contribution of all these waves is weighted by this function h, which depends only on the geometry. And this we can see as like a filter. And in typical backscattering configurations, so where the, the receiver and emitter are at the same location, this is a very, very effective filter. So this basically tells us that what we see in the Doppler spectra is not the contribution of the whole surface, but just of the waves that have a certain wave number and the corresponding wavelength, which we, we call the Bragg wave number. And it's defined by this equation. So it increases with the frequency of the signal and with the cosine of the angle. So if we have a low frequency or large angles, then we look at long waves for higher frequencies and small angles that we're looking at uh, shorter waves. So what does that mean for the Doppler spectra is, uh, imagine we fix a certain geometry, we fix a certain frequency that fixes also the wave that we're looking at on the surface. We fix this wave number, and then we see that there are three possible frequencies of waves that have that wave number, depending on what kind of surface deformation we're looking at, what kind of wave we are looking at. So for each of these frequencies, we expect to see a peak in our Doppler spectra. And then from these frequencies, we can calculate the corresponding speed of the wave if we divide by the, by the wave number. But typically we don't care about the speed of the waves. What we want really is the speed of the flow, which is this peak here in the middle. And identifying this peak is not always straightforward. So to summarize, when we do uh, some Doppler measurements, uh, we need basically two conditions to, to be satisfied at the same time. First of all, we need, of course, a rough surface, which does not only need to be rough surface, but it has to be rough at that specific scale that we are looking at, at the Bragg scale. So for example, if we don't have enough short ripples, we are typically talking about one, two centimeters at most, then perhaps we want to increase the angle. But then if we increase the angle, then we lose some resolution and it may become a bit more difficult to distinguish, to identify the multiple peaks. Also because the energy in these peaks depends on the flow conditions, depends on the presence of rain or absence of rain, depends on wind. From what we've seen, especially in shallow flows, uh, it depends on the fruit number. So it's not always straightforward to uh, get the correct uh, speed of the flow. So to try to account for this, we, we've been trying to develop some alternative approach, which has the uh, ultimate goal of trying to reconstruct the same frequency, uh, frequency wave number spectra that I showed at the beginning, because those spectra give us all the information that we need about the surface. And uh, with those spectra, it's a lot easier to identify the different types of waves. But in order to do that, we need to add some special dimension to our measurements. So we need multiple receivers, in our case, multiple microphones. And each of these lines is basically shows the Doppler spectrum at a single microphone, which is the product of that filter times the frequency wave number spectrum. And the filtering wave number is a function of the geometry. So it is different for each microphone. Basically, each microphone, each receiver, is looking at a different wave number of our wave number frequency spectrum. So if we combine all this information, then we can uh, hopefully reconstruct the full spectrum. So we do this in terms of this uh, linearized system of equation. This, it's a matrix basically of the Doppler spectra measured at all the different locations. And our goal is to invert this function and find this value, which we can do uh, relatively straightforwardly with uh, some numerical approaches. So I won't dwell into detail here, but just show some examples of our first proof of concept uh, um, experiments, which we've done in a laboratory flume. So we used some bad roughness to excite some turbulence and some surface deformations, which hopefully you can see in these images. Uh, we had a speaker uh, and uh, an array of microphones uh, which were, was recording the reflections almost in the specular, specular reflections here. This is a sound camera. It's a nice piece of kit by um, Siemens. It has a camera in the middle, but which we didn't use. Uh, 
what we did use were, were the microphones, which are arranged along these uh, rays. That's 49 microphones in total. And for each of these microphones, we calculated the Doppler spectra, like we would normally do even with the radar system, and then combine them and try to invert the, the spectra. So these are the results uh, for different flow rates from five to 27 liters per second. It's a half meter wide uh, channel. Um, and the green lines here are the expected relation between frequency and wave number for, for the different types of waves. And the one in the middle of this straight line represents turbulence generated uh, waves, which seem to be dominant in all conditions. But also we can see rather clearly an additional line in all plots which indicates the presence of gravity waves. So with this system, we can see a lot more clearly the contribution of the different types of waves and perhaps uh, it would make it easier to identify the correct speed. So for instance, from here, we can directly estimate the speed of the flow. Uh, and I'll show that tomorrow in the bigger presentation, how to do that. Uh, or if you prefer, we could do an inverse transform and then apply some correlation based method like uh, LSPIV, for example. But what really I think is the advantage of this method is that we are recording in uh, almost specular directions. So the signal to noise ratio is a lot higher. And also we are recording the 2D vectors of velocity. So uh, uh, unlike what happens with standard Doppler, we're not constrained to having to point our sensor directly against the flow, but we could also take measurements at 90 degrees, for example, if uh, there is only access from, from the bands uh, of the reader. So this is a work in progress. We are now planning some field tests. So if you want to be updated, just follow on Twitter or send me an email. I'll be happy to uh, share any, any new uh, results we get. Thank you. OK, thank you, Julia. Thank you for, for keeping to time. Do we, do we have any questions? People either want to unmute and ask a question or, um, or post it into the chat? Okay, well, as any good host, I should always have a question. So um, I, I'm intrigued to know how, how transferable to the field environment these methods are, Julia. I think, I mean, I, I love the work you're doing. I also want to applaud you for always taking the time to try and make complex stuff understandable. You, I think you do a good job on that. But, but yeah, how transferable are these methods to the field? Are we going to see arrays of speakers and microphones above rivers, or will it adapt to different sensing technologies for, for, for operational use? Uh, the same could be applied with radar. So the, the physics are basically the same. So I don't see why it, it couldn't be applied to radar. Uh, the, uh, in terms of scales, so because we're looking at almost specular reflections, then we're focusing on very long waves. So even if the whole system is, is bigger, uh, it wouldn't really be, be an issue. Uh, the limitation we have with sound is, especially ultrasound, is with the range. So we can can't really go too far away from the speaker, uh, depending on the level of noise uh, that we have. Perhaps that's something that could be solved with radar, or it depends on what kind of deployment uh, we, we can do. So we've been thinking for quite a long time about uh, trying to install this kind of uh, sensors in, uh, in drones, for example, that could um, fly above or even take a measurement everywhere. OK, thank you. Dan Parsons, is, is your question addressed to, uh, to to Julio, the smallest one? Yeah, one? it is. So, so what's the, yeah, I was going to ask, what's the, what's the smallest kind of resolution you can detect in terms of surface deformations? And, and when does, when does that kind of noise start, start becoming, becoming an issue in terms of detecting those, those kind of, I guess, capillary waves, really? So in the lab, we were measuring waves that were a tenth of a millimeter uh, in amplitude or something like that. Uh, so very small. In that sense, this is, it, it depends on what frequency is being used, but uh, it may become more of an issue if the waves become very big, in which case then you may have to increase, decrease uh, the frequency and perhaps move to audible uh, frequencies. But small waves are not really an issue. Sure. Okay. Because Thank it's you. not. It's more like the amplitude of the signal rather than the amplitude of the surface. Yeah. Understood. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Thanks very much, Julia. I'm going to try and keep us on time. So there is another question or two in the chat, Julia, if you could yep. have a look at those and reply, that'd be fantastic. Thanks very Thanks. much for your presentation.